Good afternoon from London. We have been here just staying with Rachel's aunt and uncle for the best part of this week. And we're going to be spending time here until the weekend where we're then going to catch up with my family. But it's been great. Had a lot of opportunities to catch up with friends and family ever since we touched down. And we're just about getting over the jet lag as well, uh, which is always a bonus. So there we go. We're going to be setting off on our travels in about 10 days time. And so we've done a little bit of booking ahead of time because it turns out that even though it's not quite high season, I know we're only in May, a lot of hotels have been booked up. So there wasn't much availability. Anyway, we have looked into the costs of what travel usually entails, such as transportation, whether it be by plane, bus, train, as well as obviously accommodations, and then you're looking at tours or museums or whatever sightseeing you're interested in doing. Those are all really costs that you expect. However, over the course of planning our year abroad, we have come across some additional expenses that we should have but didn't necessarily provision for. So these are a little bit more unexpected, although to some people they may be obvious. We're going to go over the costs that we maybe should have anticipated. So hopefully in the future, you can save up for them and they won't be a surprise. Let's go through the list. The first additional cost that we encountered was vaccines. Of course, the amount of vaccines and which vaccines that you need is going to depend on where in the world you are planning to travel, as well as what vaccines you already have. If you're someone who's done a lot of traveling and has been prepared and had their vaccinations along the way, you may only need one or two. However, Nick and I, because of the amount of countries that we're going to, and the fact that we hadn't traveled extensively in years, mostly because of the pandemic, meant that we needed a lot of vaccines. So just for your information, the vaccines that we needed were Hep A and Hep B. Well, Nick needed those ones. In Canada, you are given them through OHIP, I think, in high school. Uh, we needed typhoid fever. We needed cholera, yellow fever, Japanese encephalitis, rabies, meningococcal meningitis, we needed malaria tablets, as well as our tetanus shots. Now, because we live in Ontario, our tetanus shots were covered by OHIP, which is our provincial health care system, but we had to go through a private travel clinic to get our other vaccinations. I don't know how it works around the world. Some Healthcare systems may give you these vaccinations for free, but ours certainly did not. So we ended up choosing Passport Health. There are a ton of private travel clinics in Ontario that you could choose from, so you don't need to choose this one. We actually found the experience really great. They were very thorough. They were very kind. They were organized. But the unexpected part was how much it cost for us. So each of us spent upwards of $2,500 getting our vaccines. So that's a big expense that you're going to want to account for. The next consideration is insurance. Generally speaking, with travel insurance, then you would normally get that for just a single trip going from A to B, or you would get what's known as multi-trip, which would be over the course of X number of time. Then you would be going from say Canada to country A, country B, country C, but always coming back to Canada as a main base. However, in our instance, obviously that's not the case. We are continuing to bounce from country to country to country to country. And so we need a travel insurance package, which is more aligned with that. So the good news is there are a couple of different options that are available. You do have backpackers insurance, this is something that I actually used in order to come to Canada in the first place. You have to have that kind of 
insurance policy available in order to enter the country on a working holiday visa. And I believe that that's the same for pretty much any other country where you're eligible for a working holiday. However, in our instance, because of the fact that we're also going to be working on the road as well, we need to protect our electronics pretty heavily. And also the world is changing in terms of remote working options. Then there has been the emergence of what is known as digital nomad insurance. So we had a look at insurance policies that went for that. And we ended up finding this one company called Safety Wing. They are US based, but they do cover travelers who are coming out of the US and Canada. So that covered us, which is great. And the interesting thing is that you have some flexibility in the options that you go for. You can continually pay 45 Canadian dollars per month, and then that just keeps on going on an ongoing subscription model. There's no limit. Or alternatively, if you have a set date, so you're only going to be traveling from day X to day Y, then there is also an option for you to just be able to pay everything up front as well. So it does really accommodate for the flexibility of remote working and whatever travel package you want to go for. This one was one that I had done a lot of research on in terms of trying to guess the right stuff. And there are a bunch of good companies that are available to you. But in terms of the overall coverage and the value for money that this presented to us in terms of the travel we want to do, then safety wings seem to be the right thing for us. However, obviously we do understand that if you're based in Europe, there may be other providers and better providers for you. So by all means, do do your research before you go for that. But in terms of how much that ended up costing us for the total of the year, then it was about $800 each for the entirety of the year that we're planning on going traveling. So that is another cost to consider. Another cost that you should take into account is that of visas. Again, what visas you're going to need is going to depend on the countries that you're going to. Visas can be quite varied in the sense that some of them you need to apply for well in advance. Others you need to apply for 24 to 48 hours in advance. Some you can even get upon arrival at your destination. However, all visas cost a different amount. So it's really important to do your own research. We did ours by Googling the Foreign Office of Canada as well. We included the UK and your government's foreign office should have a website that lists the visa requirements for the passport that you hold. Basically, do your own research based on the countries that you're going to and calculate how much the visas cost before you go and put that into your budget. Something that is related to your visas is passport photos. Some visas require you to include a passport photo with your application, so it's important to find out how much it costs to get passport photos taken, whether that be in your home country before you leave, and then you can have a few of them that you take with you, or how much it's gonna to cost to get passport photos while you're on the road, because Countries have different passport photo requirements in terms of the sizes. They are not all standard. So you may need to pay for a few passport photos while you're on your trip, depending on how many countries you're going to. Also, if your passport's expiring, you may need to get a passport photo taken and renew your passport before you leave. So there's an additional charge and something you should be aware of. The next consideration is phone coverage. We've consistently had the same Canadian numbers for a very, very long time for each of us. And we really would like to continue having those, not least because, especially when you're banking from abroad, then you still need to be able to go through all of the security verifications, the two-factor authentications when you are abroad. We still want to be maintaining everything to do with our finances. So therefore it is 100% necessary to be able to still receive those texts and those calls into our Canadian numbers to be able to maintain that. In terms of trying to get that sorted out, it presents a bit of a challenge. Unlike certain other countries that do have a bit more flexibility in terms of their telecoms, Canada is a little bit behind all of that by all admissions. So with that then, there's no real sense of pay as you go in the same way. And so 
really you're still kind of locked into something that resembles a contract, a minimum spend in order for you to get the benefits of being able to go abroad. And also the roaming charges are astronomical. So it's 100% not worth doing unless you're only going for a short period of time and you're like, yep, fine, I'm happy to spend seven bucks a day to be able to continue using my data. We didn't think that, that wasn't for us. So we looked to slightly more alternate options and that was by going through various different messaging boards, doing big Google searches. It took a while to really try and figure out the right solution. But we've managed to figure out one particular way that is a, through a service, which is kind of like a, a VoIP service really called Fongo. And they have allowed for us to be able to port our number over to their service. And for all intents and purposes, it's a free app. It costs $25 just to port your number over. And once you have that, then that's there. As long as you are connected to the internet in some way, shape or form, then you maintain access to the service. You can have unlimited minutes when talking to people in Canada. I believe that certain messaging services like global texting and things like that may cost a little bit extra, but in terms of having that convenience, then it is far more cost effective than staying with your conventional Canadian carrier in order to then maintain your telephone communications while abroad. The other part to this though is what happens when we do go into other countries, how do we avoid those data roaming charges at all? Now, we've got a bunch of different recommendations from a bunch of different people. Most would be happy just to go and purchase a physical SIM card for every single time that they land in a new airport, they just go pick something up, that gives them a new number, and then they just keep topping up from there. We thought that, but we figured that actually we'd rather have the convenience of not necessarily having to go through all of that. And both of our phones, thankfully, are compatible with this new wonderful phenomenon called eSIMs. So essentially it's the same kind of concept. You are technically buying a SIM card, but it's all electronic. So you can activate it just through your mobile and then off you go. In terms of the marketplace that we're gonna go through, we got a couple of recommendations in order to go through and get the right thing. Because if you're not careful, you can end up really paying over the odds for this kind of service. The ones that we've managed to find is um, an app called Aerolo. They market themselves as a global eSIM marketplace where you can more or less get service for practically any country in the world, really, with each of the packages that are available, then they are pretty cost effective. And it just means that we can then just transition through different countries and we can just be covered irrespective. If you're not overly fussed with the idea of choosing a specific eSIM for a specific country though, there are region-wide ones for Europe, Asia, South America, etc. Or if you would rather just put all your eggs into one eSIM basket, then there is also a global option which then covers every single country for which they have coverage. So that to us is good. It does mean that we will probably end up having to pay probably, well, anything between about $15 to $40 every single time just to get everything sorted. But for the sake of making sure that we are connected, that we can direct ourselves um, and we can call out in case of any emergencies, then it's 100% better to have that peace of mind. We do recognize that this is all about Canada. Um, certainly, I am very fortunate in the fact that I still have a UK phone number and a UK SIM card, and that is giving me access to the whole of Europe without any additional roaming charges. Equally, if you're based in the US, and you have access to a service like Google Fi, uh, which is, from what we hear, absolutely fantastic and can cover you across pretty much the entire world, then obviously this kind of stuff doesn't necessarily apply to you in the same way. So it is definitely worth having a look into this for whichever country that you're based in, as well as whichever country you're traveling to. The next thing you should think about while you're going traveling is luggage. A lot of airlines are now traveling for not only putting luggage in the hold, but also hand luggage. Of course, the mainline carriers are less likely to charge you for hand luggage, but even they are starting to put a cost on checking in a bag. And then of course you have the low cost carriers 
and they are charging for everything, whether it be seat selection, hand luggage, they only allow you a personal item for free, and then certainly whatever luggage you put in the hold. So if you're gonna be traveling by air a lot, you need to account for the cost of luggage and seat selection in addition to the cost of your actual airline ticket. Of course, if you're traveling by bus or train or boat, they might not have luggage costs, in which case, you don't need to worry. The next part to this, since we are going to be working digitally and we are gonna need a lot of connections to things like Wi-Fi and all that kind of stuff, then this is the point where we need to consider VPNs. So we had a look around, uh, certainly went through a bunch of different top 10 websites in terms of trying to figure out what the best solution was for us. And we ended up actually landing on a brand that perhaps might be a bit familiar to a lot of you who watch YouTube quite avidly, and that is Surfshark, which this video is not sponsored by. Ah, psych. So <laughs> the reason that we went for this is actually for some of the reasons that you would have already heard about. Generally speaking, they do come very highly rated in terms of their security, um, as well as the number of countries in which they can cover. Um, and so if you want to mask your IP to make it look like you're in a different country for things like streaming and all of that kind of stuff, then that's a really good thing to do. Personally, I obviously I'm somebody who lives in Canada, but I do get that need for a slice of home every now and then. So being able to access things like BBC iPlayer is absolutely massive for me. So the ability to be able to do that without having to worry about it is really good because we could get covered for a whole 27 months at a minimal cost of about, I think, 80 dollars Canadian that would then cover us across unlimited numbers of devices and for us really it was a no-brainer. Surfshark if you're watching please sponsor us we could do with some money. But also they do have a referral link and we could get like a month for free if anyone needs a virtual private network so we will have our referral link which changes nothing for you or for us but we do actually like them, we are using them. So if you need a virtual private network, then feel free to click our link because maybe if we get enough people, we could get one month for free. Woohoo! One of the other costs that you should consider when going away is if there's any specialty clothing you will need for your destination. When we were in Morocco, I thought I had packed well. However, I really learned a lot about what I liked to wear, what I found comfortable in extreme heat conditions. So I had brought sundresses thinking they would be airy, but like a lot of people, you know that thigh chub rub, not so comfortable. Also, athletic gear, it is wonderful, except for the fact that it kind of makes me sweat a little bit more. That being said, I still have packed some athletic gear because if you're gonna be doing any hiking or I mean, we like to exercise sometimes. It's still necessary to have. But one of the things I learned was that for hot climates, it's really good to have linen because it is so breathable. So our experience in Morocco really taught us that for this year abroad, where we're really going to be going through mostly summer and hot climates, that we needed linen. So obviously that was an extra cost. We had to buy a small linen wardrobe that would take us through a year. But if you're going somewhere, let's say to do Everest Base Camp, which we wish we were going to be doing that, but that's for another time, then you would also need warm clothes. You would need hiking boots and that kind of specialty gear. Or you could just be needing to rent that specialty gear. Either way, whether it be buying wardrobe essentials for where you're going or renting wardrobe essentials and equipment for where you're going, it is a cost that you should take into consideration. Another slight quirk about living in Canada, and I feel like this may be a North America wide thing as well. Everybody drives automatic cars. While that is a lovely thing and definitely does give you some peace of mind to just be driving go-karts all day, the fact is that it does mean that it can be a little bit prohibitive when you're trying to hire a car outside of North America, because obviously it then means that for any manual car, it does tend to close you off. You do need to be a little bit mindful of that because it then means that actually Canadian driver's licenses are not necessarily the only piece of documentation that you need in order to give you the permission to rent a car in certain countries. 
So with that, then what you also need is what is called an international driver's permit. They cost $30 per person. And in order to do them, it's relatively straightforward. You just need to go into your local CAA in order to request it. The process took us, I want to say about 15, 20 minutes just for us both, but it is definitely something you would need to do. Otherwise you may run into some problems when trying to hire a car abroad. Other driver's licenses might not need this though. Uh, certainly, I don't think um, anybody who's based out in the UK has ever encountered such a problem or needs an extra piece of documentation other than their driver's license. So this is worth looking into, but the good news is that at least the additional cost is not massive by any stretch of the imagination. A smaller cost to account for when you're traveling abroad is what is known as city taxes. Something to take into consideration is the fact that in addition to your accommodation, you may be charged a minimal city tax per day. It can range anywhere from five to maybe $10 at most. It's usually quite a small amount, but it does add up when you're paying it every single day. That's just another cost to account for when you're booking your hotel accommodation and planning your travels. So imagine, you've taken care of all of these costs, everything is good to go, and you're super happy with everything that's happening. Now, what happens when you come to sort out the money? Obviously, you can go ahead and you can get some foreign currency ahead of time before you go abroad. Generally speaking, it's always best to do that before you get to the airport because the rates at airports are definitely not good. So do be mindful of that. However, in our situation, it's a little bit more unique because we are planning on bouncing around a bunch of different countries at once. Trying to kind of pre-plan for that and be like, oh, we're going to get X number of euros, X number of dinar, whatever, is going to be nigh on impossible, realistically. We kind of have to be a bit more on the fly when it comes to figuring out our money. In order to do that, then it's always worth trying to make sure that you have a good card for that specific purpose. And that can be a credit card, it can be a debit card, but essentially what you're trying to look out for is something that has zero foreign exchange fees. Now, just because you do this, it doesn't mean that you completely avoid any additional charges when you complete a foreign transaction. If you're going through the likes of MasterCard or Visa, they automatically charge you 1% for using their services as a cardholder company. So you cannot avoid that. And I believe Amex might charge the same, if not a little bit more. However, by going through either a card provider or a bank that doesn't charge any foreign exchange fees, then what that means is it doesn't charge any extra on top of that. So therefore it's making it as cheap as possible for you in order to get that done. And that can be on ATM withdrawals, as well as just your standard chip and pin or tap transactions. The likes of HSBC offer a credit card that provides zero transaction fees as well as loyalty points for their own internal scheme. Wise is an amazing foreign exchange company anyway, but they now also offer their own prepaid card where you can load cash onto that and make use of their amazing rates as you go. And equally, EQ Bank is another one that does not charge any additional foreign transaction fees for you making use of their card and that can also be linked to a bank account and things like that. Those are three fantastic options for you if you are coming from Canada and wanting to make use of any of that. The last cost that you should take note of is tips. Tipping is not common in all parts of the world. Certainly in North America, there is a big tipping culture. So if you're going to Canada or the US, you're definitely looking at tipping anywhere between 15 and 20% at restaurants. And often in Ubers and taxis as well, although some of those you could be at about 10%. What I'm trying to say is that wherever you're traveling to, Find out what their tipping culture is. You don't want to offend people by tipping them if that's not the way they do things. But you also don't want to be disrespectful and not give a tip or enough of a tip if you're somewhere that truly relies on the tipping culture. In general, it is another cost that you need to consider when traveling. And that is a not inexhaustible list of 
all of the additional cost considerations that you should be thinking about before you go on any trip, not just a gigantic round the world adventure that we're planning on doing. Those are the things that we thought of, but if there are any that you can think of that we haven't mentioned, then by all means, please leave us a comment below to give us your suggestions. At the end of the day, we're all travelers. Let's all look out for each other. Until the next time though, then take care. And keep smiling. Good afternoon from... Wait, wait, wait. Height, Welcome. height, energy. Remember last time. It can be height. <laughs> we're going to be spending here... We're... So we're... No, I don't want to start with some more wave. Okay. Mm -hmm. This is good. Bloopers. Yeah. <laughs> it's really funny that every single time I kind of come back from that, it makes it sound like I'm having a fun. I'm not, by the way. Just saying. It's the chat. I'm blaming the chat. Um, okay. <laughs>